It's Thursday, September 9. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Jamaica is on alert for the new variant of the COVID-19 virus now present in the Caribbean. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton says test samples are being sent to the Caribbean Public Health Agency to ascertain if the new strain of the virus is in the island. Dr. Tufton told reporters on Wednesday that Jamaica is closer to acquiring a genome sequencer, which will be used to detect variants of different viruses. The mu variant of the coronavirus has been named a variant of interest by the World Health Organization. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information is planning to implement character education in schools. Portfolio Minister Favel Williams says character education will build in students a sense of diligence how to focus on their studies, and how to strive to do well. She shared the plan in her Back to School broadcast recently. We target January 2022 to begin the implementation of character education in our schools, to teach our students a sense of diligence, how to focus on their studies, how to strive to do well, how to interact properly with their teachers and other students in and out of the classroom, we will be teaching them about their rights and duties as citizens, what it means to be a Jamaican. We want to teach them about a culture of peace. We want to educate them on tolerance and social partnerships. Minister Williams says character education in schools will be the launch of a sustained multi-year good parenting campaign. To help our parents eliminate corporal punishment of our children in the homes and in public spaces. We want to significantly reduce the more than 1,200 reports per month of child abuse that come to the Child Protection and Family Services Agency, CPFSA. We do this by teaching our parents good parenting. 2021 is a very active hurricane season. As of September 9, there have been nine named storms. On the eve of the anniversary of Hurricane Gilbert, there is concern of complacency. This can be summed up in the old moniker that Jamaica is a God-blessed country and will be spared the worst. There are even many anecdotal stories about hurricanes turning aside from Jamaica. But for those who lived through Hurricane Gilbert and lost loved ones and properties, those natural disasters are no laughing matter. They are anxious and fearful as they know only too well the devastation that hurricanes can cause. Jamaicans are being urged to be prepared and vigilant. On September 10, 1988, Gilbert attained hurricane status. The Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management issued hurricane warnings as Gilbert bore down on Jamaica, packing winds of 175 miles an hour. Then Jamaican Prime Minister Edward Siaga took to the airways and the streets, urging Jamaicans to prepare. By September 12, 1988, Hurricane Gilbert slammed into Jamaica as a Category 5 hurricane, packing winds of over 175 miles per hour. The eye was 40 miles wide and blanketed the entire island. In its wake, over 40 Jamaicans were dead. 80% of homes on the island were seriously damaged. Half a million were homeless and the island was without electricity for weeks. As a result of the extensive damage caused by Gilbert, the World Meteorological Organization retired the name in 1989. On the eve of the 33rd anniversary of Hurricane Gilbert, there is concern that many are extremely complacent about hurricanes and the need to be prepared. Instead, they are laid back in the presence of an active hurricane season and challenges due to COVID-19. Many anecdotal stories about hurricanes turning aside from Jamaica are also recounted. Move and shot. Elsa, 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 Elsa,
The distant memory of the haunting images of the devastation caused by Hurricane Gilbert make them anxious and fearful. One thing that does not come back is time. We have to, as Jamaicans say, take sleep and mark death. We must learn from the past to prepare for the future. Put hurricane plans in place for your family. Prepare a bag with non-perishable food, water and medicine to last each person in your family a minimum of one week. Secure all important documents in a waterproof container. Your emergency kit should also have a battery-powered flashlight, radio and solar-powered USB charger. If you can, make sure you have a portable or coal stove available. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Carol Francis. The agriculture sector is among the largest employers in Jamaica and is central to Jamaica's economic recovery. In the wake of COVID-19 and its crippling effect on the country's growth, various measures are being looked at to diversify and expand the crop sector. The development of new fisheries, such as the sea cucumber, has been given the green light. A license has been issued for the commercial fishing of sea cucumbers in Jamaican waters. But what are sea cucumbers? Marlon Samuels tells us more in this report. Many Jamaicans are not familiar with sea cucumbers. 16 species of sea cucumbers inhabit Jamaican waters. Six are deemed to be commercially viable, flexible and long. Sea cucumbers are found in both shallow and deep water. They can grow up to 10 feet long. The animal has eyes, a mouth and an anus but no limbs. Sea cucumbers are believed to be of tremendous medicinal benefits to persons with joint problems, including arthritis. In Europe, sea cucumber is used to reduce blood clots and in the treatment of certain types of cancer. They are also highly valued as food in some parts of the world due to the high level of protein. It can also be eaten raw, pickled or fried. It's added to recipes like soups, stews, and stir-fries. Sea cucumber in the Asian market cost up to 385 US dollars per kilogram. Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, Floyd Green says, Jamaica has the potential to harvest up to 30 tons per year. This would see earning of 30 million US dollars. To tap into this lucrative market, a limited entry commercial fishery for Sea cucumbers in Jamaica, begun on September 1, 2021. For the news on PBCJ, I am Marlon Samuels. Members of the public are being encouraged to report any overcharging of fares to the Transport Authority. Cabinet approved a 15% fare adjustment in bus and taxi fares, which came into effect on August 16. The rate for the elderly, the disabled and the children remains at 50% of the adult fare. There has been no change to the fare for the Jamaica Urban Transit Company, JUTC, and Montego Bay Metro. However, there have been complaints that some commuters are being overcharged. Commuters may report incidents of overcharging through the authority's toll-free line at 888-991-5687 or via WhatsApp at 876-551-8196. They will need to give the license plate number of the vehicle in question, the date of the incident, and the time and route they were traveling, and the fare that they were charged. We now get our daily market updates in this quick business report. According to the latest ex-refinery costs from Petrojam, motorists should see a decrease at the pumps in the prices of gasoline and a price increase for diesel, effective Thursday, September 9. 87 and 90 octane gasoline will be sold for $153.74 and $159.87 and 89 per litre, following price drops of $1.57 and $1.08 respectively. Automotive diesel fuel saw a price increase of $2.94 and will be sold for $146.99 per litre. 
ultra low sulfur diesel is up by a dollar one cent and will be sold for $153.08 per liter. Kerosene saw a price increase of 91 cents and will be sold for $123.98 per liter. Propane liquid petroleum increased in price by $1.83 and will be sold for $71.92 per liter. Butane liquid petroleum will be sold for $80.57 per liter after an increase of $3.06. Be on the lookout for price changes as marketing companies and retailers will add their markup to these prices. In Wednesday's trading session, the JSE combined index declined by 1,425 points to close at over 412,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 95 stocks, of which 37 advanced, 39 declined, and 19 traded firm. The junior market index advanced by 2.42 points to close at over 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 1834 Investments Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, and Blue Power Group Limited. Stocks declined for Barita Investments Limited, Berger Paints Jamaica Limited, and CAC 2000 Limited. Trading firm were Access Financial, Financial Services Limited, CAC 2009.5 Preference Shares, CAC 2000 Limited, and Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited. Pulse Investments Limited was the volume leader with over 4.1 million units, followed by Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 2 million units, and Future Energy Source Company Limited Ordinary Shares with over 2 million units. In foreign exchange trading for Wednesday, September 8, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $150.90. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $119.86, the pound sterling traded for $207.79, and the euro sold for an average $178.76. In market data for oil, prices rose for a second session on Thursday, recovering from earlier losses as a decline in U.S. Gulf of Mexico output following damages from Hurricane Ida underpinned the market. Brent crude futures added 23 cents to $72.83 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate rose 15 cents to $69.45 a barrel. And that's our package for the Business Report. I'm Carol Francis sitting in for Gabriel Thompson. some of the stories making headlines across our region. Cuba has become the first country in the world to vaccinate children as young as two years old. The inoculation of kids two to 11 years began on Monday as the communist island grapples with rising COVID-19 cases as well as the challenge of resuming in-person education. They have been using the Abdallah and Soberena homegrown vaccines which are not yet recognized by the World Health Organization. TTT News spoke with the Cuban ambassador Tanea Diego Lati, who confirmed that COVID-19 shots are being administered to the little ones. We begun the vaccination in the population from 2 to 11 years. This, of course, this approval of the national authority of the emergency use of these vaccines in terms of the pediatric age have previously approved a clinical say trial since June. On minors were conducted on Friday and vaccines for the problem. The communist island of 11.2 million people aims to inoculate all its children before physically reopening schools that have been closed for the most part since March 2020. The new school year started on Monday, but from at home via television programs, as most Cuban homes do not have internet access. The Cuban ambassador says so far, there have been no severe adverse reactions for the children. It's a safe vaccine that there hasn't been registered any adverse effects, grave I mean. The only effects that they have registered in the in children, same as that in other adults, is in some cases a little pain in the, in the side of where you put the gap, you know, the, the arm. This normal, normal situation. Schools reopened in St. Kitts and Nevis on Wednesday. SKN Newsline's Glenn Bart provides an update in this special report. 
The start of any school year has always been a challenging one as well as an exciting one. This year, schools are re being reopened in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we all know what has happened over the past few months with the COVID-19 on the rise. And so there is some concern as schools are reopened. SK Newsline went about to various schools, primary and high schools, and had a chat with some of the head officials um, who lead those establishments. We are going to get a feel for what has transpired um, in the early hours of the school reopening and see how well things have gone um, at each of those schools. So in this era of COVID-19, we recognize that the conditions keep changing almost on a daily basis. And so we recognize that it's important for us to first be equipped with whatever information, the requisite information to guide us as to how to approach this educational setting. We had a trial run, as I alluded to a little earlier, last year in which we were able to implement certain protocols. And as such, we ensured that those protocols run through this time around. The basic things like trying to ensure that all of our students were equipped with a face mask, that's one of the things that we tried to, well, actually we insisted that all of the students wear a face mask and wear it appropriately. We recognize that the situation with COVID is very fluid and so we are preparing to go virtual as well. So this afternoon, some information regarding the status of our students, especially our incoming first farmers in terms of devices, internet, those will be collected across the entire school so that we as a staff could see the complexion of what it is with our students, what's happening in their homes as it relates to the devices, access to devices and the internet in particular, so that if we move towards the virtual modality that it does not impede or hinder the students from getting the necessary instructions or lessons that they are due. So we have catered to them virtually and we have catered to them physically as they are here and ready to learn. Okay, let me first say that uh, how excited I am to have uh, the children back at school face to face. This morning went extremely well. I must uh, commend the parents for trying their best to adhere to the COVID protocols. The children, they came this morning, everyone was wearing their mask and wearing their mask properly. Upon arrival, uh, they were sanitized, temperatures were checked, and they made their way to their classrooms. But we are trying our best to keep the children in their bubbles. We would have created bubbles to prevent uh, in the event, God forbid, that anything happens, we, we have minimal um, exposure, you know, to the other children. So the only challenge that I foresee is, you know, the children staying in their bubbles. And additionally, another challenge is, you know, having the children wear their mask properly. Yes. So we have had a chance to speak with a lot of the principals, deputy, deputy heads of the primary and high schools of, a, of several of the institutions that we visited um, this morning. We are, we are feeling that uh, most of the reopenings have been well organized, things went fairly smoothly, and uh, that the staff and students are prepared to work hard at this, um, COVID, uh, the COVID-19 protocols to keep themselves safe. Now, uh, we also get a, got an idea as to what are some of the focal um, areas of interest over the next few weeks in terms of um, independence celebrations, in terms of preparing some of the fifth form students to take their exams um, coming up um, in, a, in a few months' time. SK Newsline has been on the ground covering some of the key issues facing the school reopening and speaking with some of the principals on how things went. This is Glenn Barrett reporting for SK Newsline.
over in Trinidad and Tobago. Out of the over 14,000 fully vaccinated people who arrived in the country since the border reopening on July 17, only two people have tested positive for COVID-19. This, according to Chief Medical Officer Dr. Rashan Parasaram, who said based on this, there is no need to change the country's traveling policy. Sunil Lala of TTT News has more. If we look at that cohort, two persons positive out of 14,222, it means that 99.986% of them did not develop COVID upon entry into the country, at least that we are not aware. It is an extremely small percentage of people to change the policy for. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Roshan Parashram is defending entry protocols into this country, saying there has been a very small percentage of fully vaccinated people testing positive for the virus. The two vaccinated individuals who had the virus also tested positive for the Delta variant, but Dr. Parashram says one of them would have undergone some form of quarantine since that person is involved in the energy industry and was in quarantine prior to being deployed offshore and says that person's eight contacts have since tested negative for the virus. The other vaccinated person, though, would have been able to go straight home where they developed symptoms and four close contacts have been identified. However, Dr. Parashram says although there's no requirement to isolate upon return, vaccinated people should still do so as a precaution. They had that person coming in, going home, and doing exactly what we are seeing people to do. Have that level of personal responsibility, isol um, quarantining yourself to some extent, making sure you minimize your contact. And of course, as soon as he got symptoms, he would have tested, which is really what we want. Dr. Parashram says based on a minuscule percentage of vaccinated people testing positive, it does not warrant a more stringent measure of quarantine. Now that we have two out of 14,000 people being positive, builds the case to not have a punitive measure of quarantine of 14 days or otherwise. For that small, extremely small subset of people, where you have 99% of people having to pay the price for an extremely small proportion of possibility of COVID. Dr. Parashram also believes the mandatory PCR test requirement 72 hours prior would have also contributed to an even lower number of positive cases entering this country. Sonolala, TTT News. In sports, we're opening play with football. Jamaica's reggae boys salvaged their first point in the final round of CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers on Wednesday when they held Costa Rica to a one-all result. In their away match, the hosts found the net in the third minute courtesy of Jimmy Marin. But the boys found their equalizer in the 47th minute when Shamar Nicholson headed home across from Kamara Lawrence. Jamaica stepped up its urgency as it chased a winner. However, the Ticos managed to hold on for a draw. The next match assignment for the reggae boys will travel to the U.S. to face the Gold Cup champions. Olympic champion Elaine thompson Herrera, the second fastest woman ever in the 100 meters, will line up in her pet event today at the Wanda Diamond League in Zurich, Switzerland. thompson Herrera and fellow Olympic champion Hansel Parchment are leading 12 Jamaicans at the event. Parchment will line up in the 110 meters hurdles, while others, including Sharika Jackson in the 200 meters and Natoya Gul in the women's 800 meters, will also be in the race for titles. And with that, we call full time on today's newscast. Thanks for making it PBCJ, the people's station.